As a side note, let me say that Zev acknowledges the fear associated with participating in public discourse and is brave enough to join in at a young age, to push forward, to change his mind publicly, to learn, to articulate difficult, nuanced ideas, and grow from the conversations that follow. He clears a space in the forest to serve his concert platform. To persuade females to come close and admire his plumes, he sings the most complex song he can manage, and he does that by copying the songs of all the other birds he hears around him, such as the kookaburra. It's a very convincing impersonation. Even the original is fooled. He can imitate the calls of at least 20 different species. He also, in his attempt to outsing his rivals, incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. That was a camera shutter. And again. And now a camera with a motor drive. And that's a car alarm. And now the sounds of foresters and their chainsaws working nearby. Dear Sev, I would like for you to consider, if you will, the lyrebird, native to the rainforests of Australia. This animal, famed for its imitation signs, produces an auditory phenomenon wherein, gathering all immediately available sensory data from its surroundings, this creature, by nature of the alchemy of the almighty lyrebird mind, transmutes local sounds into the cooing tones of a sexual reproductive vehicle. Philosophers are identically the same. Sartre the Philanderer, Hell is other people, he cries, while him and Beauvoir seduce their enchanted students. Foucault said himself that he only became interested in philosophy when he noticed beautiful boys paid attention to him. And I quote, I wasn't always smart. I was actually very stupid in school. There was a boy who was very attractive, who was even stupider than I was. And to ingratiate myself with this boy, who was very beautiful, I began to do his homework for him. And that's how I became smart. I had to do all this work to just keep ahead of him a little bit. In a sense, all the rest of my life, I've been trying to do intellectual things that would attract beautiful boys. Michel Foucault, 1983. I wince. Even today, at the professors I encountered, studied in the French School of Resentment, who tried to intimidate me into taking this man's position seriously as if it were a platonic form and not the obvious, even self-described, fiery treaties as sexual means to an end for this individual man, and thus, so it is for all men. This idea of a project of philosophy is nonsense. The utility of any one philosophy, in particular, is specific to the needs of the people around it. A philosophy serves life. Life lives in an environment. If one cannot sense deeply the irony of a man who skeptically challenging the entire metaphysics of Western medicine, of sickness and of fitness, of normal and of normal, questioning the ultimate power of any authority, of any system employing the measuring stick of normalizing to be responsible for those deemed to be outside of the normative window created, i.e. his conclusion that Western medicine would inevitably oppress him and his homosexual kin, died of AIDS. And I quote, Foucault spent many evenings in the San Francisco gay scene, frequenting sadomasochistic bathhouses, engaging in unprotected sex. He praised sadomasochistic activity in interviews with the gay press, describing it as the real creation of new possibilities of pleasure, which people had no idea about previously. Please, examine this graph of global AIDS deaths. Deaths down everywhere. People living, i.e. surviving with AIDS up. I would say, the insinuation that, for this to be the case, that AIDS research was mostly conducted by self-interested homosexuals would be a bit of a statistical stretch, and to also, interrelated, say that it has not benefited the gay community disproportionately than perhaps even the immediate scientists responsible for keeping Magic Johnson alive would be farcical. Western medicine as eternally and implicitly cruel to the homosexual community? The history of the AIDS crisis and the Western response to it in the 21st century begs to differ, including in places like Africa, where humanitarian efforts have constantly been sieged to make headway in places where homosexuality remains illegal to this day. Yes, Foucault, damn the West. We should chase our pleasures ceaselessly into the wind. 
So Foucault's philosophy, which is more like a long-winded French style of poetry, can only exist at the macro level, like physics without friction, academic navel-gazing, and cannot function at the micro level, as it falls apart under scrutiny when held to account against any observations from experience, even only a handful of years after his death. So, what was the purpose of his philosophy? Do you see it now, Zev? He achieved the aim of his philosophy, or life achieved it with him. The boys, the boys, like the successful liar bird, not the truth, capital T truth, like the deceived Platonist. Foucault completed his function. He did it right. Even Kurt Cobain made it before killing himself, producing a beautiful daughter. Aside, it should be noted, violent conflict and artistic achievement both peak in males around the same age, 27. Why, Zev? Think about it. Your uncle is a biologist, right? An overflow of sexual energy. The 27 Club? Why is there a 27 Club? Why is it not known, colloquially, instead, as the 26 Club or the 28 Club? Have you seen the soft lines of a bell curve? Everything trends a certain way for a reason, as if it were being cradled in the orchestrated arms of the universe. But again, why is the tension stronger in the artist, and particularly the 27-year-old artist? Because the sexual energy is greater. Those have been the peak years for mating since prehistory, biologically. Yes, yes, Malcolm Gladwell. I know there are Cezans who are pushing 80 when they achieve artistic merit, and Abrams who are a billion years old when they are beckoned to generate sets of children who will number the stars. But never forget that even if sexual overflow is present in the elderly, that the drive, the instinct, is from the young. It has just merely survived long enough to have made it to a ripe old age of 80 in this specific being. In art, just the same as in philosophy, an aged Picasso scrawls pictures of naked teenage girls well into his 90s. Life doesn't just stop, and art and violence and philosophy are one and the same. Bradley Noel, fucking, fighting, it's all the same. Art, from the prefix arma, as in armaments, weapons, to fit together, to make weapons. Art is a weapon. The lyrebird is warding off other lyrebirds, like Foucault is warding off other queer existentialist philosophers from his beautiful boys. Think on it. Your children will number the stars? That is the promise? Ah, life, art and philosophy, great mystery to the monkeys. To quote from Charles Darwin's M notebook, M standing for Metaphysics and Morals, he writes, Origin of man now proved. Metaphysic must flourish. He who understands baboon will, crossed out, would do more towards metaphysics than Locke. A dog whines, and so does man. Dog laughs for joy. So does dog bark, not shout, when opening his mouth in romps, so he smiles. Many of action, as hiccough and yawn, are probably merely co-organic as connection of mame and womb. So, art, philosophy included, an overflow of sexual energy, of life mastering you like a puppet for its purposes, survival, reproduction, procreation. Think about that, Zev. What is the telos of Judaism, the greatest art that ever existed by the greatest metaphysicians who ever lived? Israel, number the stars. All art, all philosophy serves life first and foremost. Life is doing us. We are not doing philosophy. Nietzsche noted that the question, what should I do, is a syntax error. There is nothing you should do. In fact, you are being done. Here's some philosophy for you, Zev. Know thyself. Desire, Latin for desirous, as in down from the stars, as in our desires come from where? Who knows? Down from the stars, I guess. May your children, your ideas, number the stars. Think on Dawkins' 1976 work, The Selfish Gene. Your philosophy, 
Zev, being your meme, your child, your art, your lyrebird song, cobbled together from the scraps of the jungle, as presented to the world for judgment and scrutiny. I would like to share one last anecdote relating to the lyrebird before I continue. Carl Jung, studying Nietzsche, comes across a long section in a passage which he immediately remembers having seen identically somewhere else before. From Carl Jung, and I quote, I myself found a fascinating example of this in Nietzsche's book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where the author reproduces, almost word for word, an incident reported in a ship's log for the year 1686. By sheer chance, I had read the seaman's yarn in a book published about 1835, half a century before Nietzsche wrote, and when I found the similar passage in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, I was struck by its peculiar style, which was different from Nietzsche's usual language. I was convinced that Nietzsche must also have seen the old book, though he made no reference to it. I wrote to his sister, who was still alive, and she confirmed that she and her brother had in fact read the book together when he was 11 years old. I think, from the context, it is inconceivable that Nietzsche had any idea that he was plagiarizing the story. I believe that, 50 years later, it has unexpectedly slipped into focus in his conscious mind. C.G. Young, Man and His Symbols When it clicks, to hear, in Nietzsche, for the first time, the sound of the camera shutter, life becomes a little stranger, a little colder, a little lighter. I like mystery. It was the most astonishing reformulation of my understanding of a person I ever had to grapple with. To see people not as free will machines, but to see, even in their ideas, their words, their sounds, only the regurgitated sign vomit of their surroundings. All of this has led me to wish to address you, Zev, because I see myself in you, and there are many areas of interest which I wish had been shared with me when I was your age. Rabbi Wolpe imbued me with an honest and unselfish love of life, which I had never experienced before, a love of life over and above myself, for the first time ever. My Protestant narcissism, as reinforced by society at large and family around me, slipping away, myself not as center of the universe. Few other artists have imparted that upon me, let alone made its impact felt so strongly. I think of Raymond Carver at the end of his wonderful cathedral. I was in my house, I knew that, but I didn't feel like I was inside anything. It's really something, I said. I think of Tolstoy during the epilogue of War and Peace. As in the question of astronomy then, so in the question of history now, the whole difference of opinion is based on the recognition or non-recognition of something absolute serving as the measure of visible phenomena. In astronomy, it was the immovability of the earth. In history, it is the independence of personality, free will. As with astronomy, the difficulty of recognizing the motion of the earth lay in abandoning the immediate sensation of the earth's fixity and of the motion of the planets. So in history, the difficulty of recognizing the subjection of personality to the laws of space, time, and cause lies in renouncing the direct feeling of the independence of one's own personality. But as in astronomy, the new view said, it is true that we do not feel the movement of the earth, but by admitting its immobility, we arrive at absurdity, while by admitting its motion, which we do not feel, we arrive at laws. So also in history, the new view says, it is true that we are not conscious of our dependence, but by admitting our free will, we arrive at absurdity, while by admitting our dependence on the external world, on time, and on cause, we arrive at laws. In the first case, it was necessary to renounce the consciousness of an unreal immobility in space and to recognize a motion we did not feel. In the present case, it is similarly necessary to renounce a freedom that does not exist and to recognize a dependence of which we are not conscious. I'm reminded of Leonard Cohen. The model I finally understood, he recalled, suggested that there really is no fixed self. The conventional therapeutic wisdom today encourages the sufferer to get in touch with his inner feelings, as if there were an inner self, a true self, the real self that we have glimmerings of in dreams and insights. There is no real inner self to command your loyalty in the tyranny of your investigation. What happened to me was not that I got any answers, but that the questions dissolved. As one of Balsakar's students said, I believe in cause and effect, 
but I don't know which is which. I am a liar bird. Zev, you are a liar bird. I hear in your song, having studied your father, the undeniable sounds of his camera shutter. And I've always had some questions, not answers. I come bearing no answers, just questions, for some of his expressed beliefs, which, frankly, I feel better addressed here, through the vessel of his son. I thoroughly enjoyed your dialogue with Lex, and especially Lex's infrequent titillated laughter at your well-articulated thoughts. What is laughter if not the truth escaping? There is something sweet and earnest about a young person doing philosophy, as it were, that is endearing to those who have gone through the same ritual. Philosophy being more a series of elucidations on subjects rather than any platonic pursuit of higher truths. I think that is why Lex chuckles, and I smile too, because we both see ourselves in you, Zev. So, let us explore some of your delightful, youthful, philosophic gatherings, and while I offer nothing in the way of explanations, answers, or simples, I wish only to communicate, to complicate, to add an aphorism here and there, to point out that perhaps you might just have gathered for your song a few incomplete sounds, which I too previously stumbled upon, just like you, for your lyrebird stage. I want your performance to be bold, brash, beautiful. I wish only to share my mistakes. Nietzsche said he philosophized with a hammer, smashed decadent values. Wittgenstein said he philosophized with a ladder, climbed out of the deceptive pit of language. I philosophize with string. I wish only to tangle you up so you may busy yourself with getting free again, like a game, a kind of entertainment, if you will, like a kitten all wrapped up in warm yarn. So, I challenge you, as a young academic-style philosopher, to rise to the challenge, to do what I see most young academic-style philosophers unable to do, articulate, intuit, and understand in full the nature of the dispute which occurred between G. E. Moore and Wittgenstein regarding Moore's paper a proof of the external world, which resulted in the production of Wittgenstein's final text, if his brilliant scribbled notes can be called such a thing, on certainty. I see a touch of more in you, which is worth exploring. As well, for a young writer who I wish to see challenged and made stronger in the arena of public discourse, your armor must be tested, your senses, your weapons too. If you discover why more and Wittgenstein disagree, in it is contained the entire current academic philosophic landscape in a nutshell. I think it would be prescient to consider next why Wittgenstein struck near Karl Popper with a hot poker during a debate and why he hit a child he was teaching in a math class, fleeing. Also, why did three of Wittgenstein's four brothers commit suicide? I am reminded of David Foster Wallace. Think of the old cliché about the mind being an excellent servant but a terrible master. This like many clichés, so lame and unexciting on the surface, actually expresses a great and terrible truth. It is not the least bit coincidental that adults who commit suicide with firearms almost always shoot themselves in the head. They shoot the terrible master. And the truth is that most of these suicides are actually dead long before they pull the trigger. I would like to welcome you warmly to the arena of public discourse. The monkeys are strange. The earth even stranger. May God be with you, Zev, and hot pokers away from you. Lovingly yours, Wax Costanza. <laughs>